Good day, subscribers. Thank you so much for joining me today. I am Jeremy. This is the Financial Education Channel, and today we're breaking down Smith & Weston stock. So by the way, this company changed its name recently within the past year to like American Outdoor Brands or some crap like that. But for the sake of this video, we're calling it Smith & Weston because that's what I've always called it since... I found out about this company when I started investing and whatnot. So this is a company we're breaking down. This stock was suggested by one of my subscribers. They suggested it like 20 videos in a row that I did where I broke down stocks. I swear to you, they kept suggesting it. I can't remember the name of whoever was suggesting it, but you suggested it so many stinking times, and I'm like, I just got to break down that stock once and for all. So we're doing it today. We're going to find out, is this gun stock a buy? Now, well, first off, before I even get into this video, I realize some people are against guns. That's fine. Doesn't mean you can't invest in it. Doesn't mean you can't make money in it. Doesn't make you an evil person if you invest in a gun stock, even if you don't believe in that gun stock, or you're not you're against guns for that matter. Just the same way as if you invest in a smoking company, a cigarette company, doesn't mean you're a bad person. Heck, you can they, those cigarette companies they pay fat dividends. You could just collect that money and give it away to some anti-smoking proposition or something like that. You know what I mean? So you can still make money off things that maybe you don't you're not too thrilled with. So I just want to say that out there first, guys, because there's nothing wrong with making money off it because it's either you're going to make money off it or someone else is going to make money off it. Because the company, if they're going to do good, they're going to do good no matter what. So just think about that for a second, guys. So that's kind of what I tell everybody. You know, if you same thing with alcohol stocks. If you're against drinking and some of those things, you can still make money off them if you think that's a good investment. People are drinking, and heck, you can spend that money on clinics to help people not drink and things like that. So just think about that, guys. It's either you're going to make that money or someone else is going to make that money. So. Anyways, let's get into this one, guys. Leave a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video today, and also leave me a comment on what stock you would love to see me break down next week, please. Let's get into this. So what do they do? We're going to read through the first couple sentences here. We are the world's leading, we're one of the world's leading manufacturers of firearms and a provider of quality accessory products for the shooting, hunting, and rugged outdoor enthusiasts. Then it goes into talking about we manufacture a wide array of handguns. They do... They do, uh, you know, rifles as well. They're one of the biggest handcuff manufacturers in the world, actually. That's kind of random. Firearm-related things, they, you know, they're in everything. They, they sell firearms to the government, to states. They obviously sell the majority of their, their revenue comes from just selling to regular people. So they get money from a lot of different ways. That's their business. Not too complicated. Their strategy, our objective is to continue to enhance our position as one of the world's leading firearm manufacturers and to become a leading provider of quality accessory products for the shooting, hunting, rugged outdoor markets. Key elements of our strategy to achieve this objective are as follows. And then we go into talk about here. They want to continue to expand our rapidly growing accessories business. Accessories. Think about that, guys. We plan to continue to expand our rapidly growing accessories business with the ongoing introduction of new products that support the, honey, uh, so the shooting, hunting, and rugged outdoor markets. We will continue to enhance our presence in the existing domestic and international as well as new markets capitalizing on our brands such as Caldwell. And then they talk about all their different brands they have. So... The accessories business, this is a big focus, I, and it's a big theme I noticed in their annual report as I read it. By the way, we're looking at their annual report right now, just in case any of you guys out there were wondering. It's on their investor relations page, the Smith & Wesson page, or Outdoor, or whatever the crap the company's called now. But it's Smith & Wesson. Type it in. Or you can Google it. It'll come up there. So the accessories business, it's a big focus for them. I noticed that theme throughout the annual report. They're very focused on building that accessories business. Which is, which is smart in a, in a way because you're only going to sell so many guns, right? Somebody buys a gun, okay, that's great. You sold them that one gun. But the trick is you want to try to sell some other products, maybe a holster for that gun to go to, maybe something that like a, like a laser type aim that goes on that gun, maybe a different type of handle that can go on that gun, a different type of clip. All these kinds of things are all definitely ways Smith & Wesson or whatever the crap this new company is called they've changed their name to. It's, it's ways that they can make money after just selling that gun. Because someone might only buy one gun per year, but now if you can sell them three or four or five accessories to go with that, then you're talking about a lot of extra money coming into you. So it's a big thing. It's a big theme I noticed throughout it. 
And then I kind of looked at their accessory products and there's some of their revenue and whatnot. So we're looking down here at the bottom. Our accessory net sales for the year ended April 30th, 2016 were $65 million it did in accessory revenue. For the period, the previous year, December 11th, 2014, uh, the date of the BTI acquisition to April 30th, 2015, net sales of accessories were only 20, 20 million, $20.6 million. So, and then gross profit, look at the gross profit there. The gross profit in 2016 was 32 million versus in 2015, 6 million. They're making huge profits on this, guys. Huge profits. And it's growing like gangbusters for them the way they've acquired companies and just grown the business overall. So it's a big focus for them. And when you put up those kind of numbers and those kinds of growth and that type of profitability, I can see why they have a big focus on accessories. So this is big time for them. Next up here, we're looking at R&D. I thought this was important to highlight here because through the advanced product uh, products engineering departments, we enhance existing products and develop new firearm and accessory products. In 2016, 2015, and 2014, our gross spending of research activities relating to the development of products was 10 million, 6.9 million, and 5.6 million. This was important because I'm impressed that they're increasing R&D spend as much as they are as a gun company because there's not a ton that happens over time in the gun set. This isn't a tech company or something like that. So to spend $10 million a year and have that go from $6.9 million to $10 million in one year, I think that's very impressive. And I think that's a good focus on them to not only build new firearms, but expand this accessories business, which is very important. You know, Apple makes a ton of money off accessories. GoPro, my biggest investment, they make they have so many different accessories that can go on a GoPro that they make a lot of income around that GoPro because they know they're only going to sell a certain amount of GoPros a year. Same thing with Smith & Weston here. They only know they're going to sell a certain amount of guns per year, so let's sell some accessories, and I guarantee you that's where the majority of that R&D spend is going. They don't break it out like that, but I can guarantee you that accessories business is where they're spending a lot of that R&D money. Next up here, we're looking at... Uh, customers. So we're looking at the bottom paragraph here. During fiscal 2016, 6.5% of our firearm net sales were to state, local, law enforcement agencies, and the federal government. So 3.1% also from international cu customers, 90.4% was uh, just selling to basically regular people. This is important because they had a big loss the other day of a customer, a federal government customer that is kind of important to them. I can guarantee you they get a big portion of their revenue from this customer. So look at this here, guys. The U.S. Army on Friday ended a nearly 10-year, so this just happened yesterday, or, well, you're probably watching this video in the future, but anyways, it just happened the other day. The U.S. Army on Friday ended a nearly 10-year-long competition to supply this service with a new handgun. The Army awarded a contract valued at $580 million dollars to Sig Sawyer, a subsidiary of Germany's Luke uh, Orbiter Group, or whatever you call it, a subsidiary based in New Hampshire, American Outdoor Brands, which is a company we're talking about that I keep calling Smith & Wesson, by the way. The holding company that owns Smith & Wesson was among the four also rands, along with FN and Beretta and Glock. So basically, Smith & Wesson lost a huge contract. That's a massive contract there, guys valued at $580 million over 10 years. That's basically $58 million in extra revenue if Smith & Wesson could have got that, or I should start calling it American Outdoor Brands. If they would have gotten that contract, guys, $58 million is a substantial amount of money. And I bet you half that money would have gone straight to the bottom line. So we're talking about a $26 million potentially, $28 million type number they could have basically had to the bottom line. So it's a big loss by them, and, and the stock suffered a little bit. I didn't think it suffered quite as much. Maybe they got leaked before that maybe they were going to lose that contract or whatnot. So that's big there, guys. Next one up here, we're looking at the – we're talking about uh, the, our performance. We're in the risk factor section now. Our performance is influenced by a variety of economic, social, and political factors. So we're looking at the bottom paragraph here, guys. Federal and state legislatures – Frequently consider legislation relating to the regulation of firearms. These proposed bills are often varied but may seek to restrict the makeup of a firearm, including limitations of magazine capacity, mandate the use of certain technologies in a firearm, or ban the sale in some cases of ownership of various firearms. 
So this is always kind of like the biggest risk factor with a gun related stock is what if the government bans the gun, especially in the United States where so, you know, everybody seems to have a gun in the United States or <laughs> some have a lot more than one gun. So that's the end of the worry. But in my opinion, this works actually to their advantage because every time the government and we're going to look at some numbers in a minute. Anytime the government actually kind of like threatens maybe a ban of guns or a ban of something, gun sales go through the roof. So we're looking here, one of the saddest days in American history, or at least modern American history. I mean, probably the saddest day since September 11, 2001, when the Twin Towers went down. Sandy Hook Elementary School, this was in 2012. You know, December 2012, the, the guy went in there. He shot like 20 kids, killed them bunch of teachers he just blew them away and whatnot uh, just a sad horrible thing this was obviously all over american news this might even have been around worldwide news i don't know but i know it was all over in american news for weeks it was just on everybody's mind and whatnot president obama came out he was just he cried in the press conference i remember and i remember the whole negativity toward guns like that was ended up kind of like being the blame the gun was the problem and what that did what that did is because Obama would then become president again and got reelected at that same time, there was just this whole like thought of, of what if Obama bans the guns or something, and gun sales went insane after that happened. O Obama's reelection and the Sandy Hook shooting the month after that all went down, two million guns sold. Two million guns, guys, in a month. And you can see on the chart there how much of an increase that was versus any previous time. So that whole massacre in, in Obama, you know, kind of coming out against guns and there being a lot of political force against guns. And then the NRA, of course, they're so powerful. They put and pushed back and said, hey, everybody, pay attention to this. We need to go out and buy guns now. And we also need to fight this off and things. It just made people that believe that guns could be taken just go out and buy them at insane rates. I was a direct beneficiary, unfortunately, of this whole situation. I owned a stock named Cabela's at this time. And Cabela's is a retailer of guns, uh, ammo, all types of things. There are outdoor products and all those kinds of things. But during that time, Cabela's was absolutely packed every single day. It took you an hour to two hours just to get to the gun counter. I remember I'd go and the shelves would be completely wiped out of ammunition. Like it was about to be zombie apocalypse or something. It was like something I've never seen. The amount of guns they had, they had a, they usually had the handguns like placed like this far apart, and they had huge cases, you know, uh, 20, 30 yard cases of just handguns, and they used to have them like this far place. They had so few handguns left at one point. Then I remember like a handgun would be here in the case, and a handgun would be here. Usually it used to be like 20 guns in this little amount of space, and there's like one over here, one over here. They had to like separate them so the case wouldn't look too empty and things like that. It was unbelievable, guys. I remember it like it was yesterday. Cabela stock shot through the roof. I made a, a massive amount of money on it. And, and it's unfortunate because it came at the expense of basically that whole disaster, or the whole Sandy Hook thing and everything. And it's just a really horrible thing. But needless to say, the gun stocks, they went up like crazy. And anything related to guns, a retailer like I own Cabela's, they all did phenomenal. The profits just began to get insane for those companies. It was like, I remember Cabela's would report like same store sales up 20, 30 percent, like ridiculous numbers that you just never hear about from a retailer. It was insane time, guys. So keep that in mind that the, it's always a worry that government could take guns or could limit guns and those kinds of things whenever you own a gun stock or a gun related stock. But also keep in mind that the government can also kind of push people to actually go out and buy firearms more, go buy ammunition, go buy from these retailers and some of those kinds of things. So think about that, guys, in the future. That's kind of a risk factor, but it's also kind of like uh, something the government can do to actually push sales big time. Next one up here, guys, let's look at these income statement here. So revenue, um, it fell from 2014, which was kind of the end of the gun boom, into 2015. And then it was kind of a gun glut. Because 2012, 2013 were so strong with guns that retailers like my Cabela's and like Bass Pro Shops and all those kinds of places, they ordered such a massive amount of guns that it pushed these stocks up even higher as far as the amount of sales they would make. So 2015 was kind of like the year where those retailers cleared all that inventory. Then we go into 2016 where they posted very nice numbers, $722 million in revenue. That's a huge increase from 551 the previous year. On the bottom line, look what the bottom line did. 
from $49 million in 2015 all the way up to $93 million last year. So huge difference. We can see, you know, this company's gotten back on track as far as revenue, as far as gross profit goes. Huge growth. Very impressive, I must say. Now let's look at that balance sheet. So they have $191 million in cash. It's very nice. Short-term debt, or excuse me, short-term investments, they have none. Then we're going to go around and look under term, total current assets there. Under as long-term investments, long-term investments, they have none. Then we're going to look at the liabilities down there. Short slash current long-term debt of $6.3 million. And then a few lines lower, long-term debt of $166 million. So basically... It's kind of like a wash sale. They have a little more cash than they do debt. Balance sheet's not that great. It's not that great. I know they spent a lot of money acquiring other companies to kind of build up this profitability and whatnot. It's just an all right balance sheet. Nothing, nothing to be scared about. Nothing to be like, oh my gosh, that's such a great balance sheet. Certainly not. It's just all right. Next one up, let's look at the uh, statistics here to kind of finish this out, see if this company is a deal. So first off, they have a market cap of a little over $1 billion, $1.1 billion. They have uh, no trailing PE because they had acquired companies, so they took a loss last year as far as, uh, I guess you can say, a gap loss. And then forward PE, but look at that forward PE. It's an 8, an 8 forward PE. That's insane how low that is, an 8 forward PE. 52-week uh, high of $22, 52-week low of $20. Right now it's around $21, so we're rating right that kind of, it hasn't moved much, this stock, this year. It has not moved much at all. So when I look at this stock, I think it's, oh, man, I want to say it's a buy so bad. But here's my reason why I'm not going to say it's a buy. Because we now have a Republican-run country at the moment. We have a Republican president. We have a Republican, um, you know, Congress, Republican everything, House. Everything is Republican right now. Republicans don't want to limit guns. We know that. So I actually think what can happen now with this stock and with all gun-related stocks is actually sales will start to go down now at this point because everybody's going to realize, oh, no one's going to take my guns anytime soon. I don't need to go buy a bunch more guns or a bunch more ammunition. So I think we could be looking at gun sales actually being substantially lower over the next two to four years and kind of uh, gun sales come back to reality. That's what I'm looking at here when I look at this, this stock. So for me, I don't want to buy it just because I'm very, very, very worried about that. Even though it has an 8P, even though it, you know last year the, there was great growth. But remember, last year at this time, who did everybody think was going to be president of the United States? They thought Hillary Clinton. So we're talking about a whole different ball game here politically, guys. So that for that reason, I cannot I cannot get behind this stock just because I'm worried that the revenue and profits are going to be going down over the next few years. I don't see how they're going to grow when there's not that fear of, man, maybe somebody's going to take my guns or something like that out there, guys. Because that, honestly, it pushes the gun sales. The charts show that. Look what happened after Sandy Hook. Look what happened when President Obama was reelected. Gun sales went insane. So when there's not that fear out there, people kind of pull back. And I'm afraid that's what's going to happen with this stock. So anyways, we'll see how things go. I hope you enjoyed this video today, guys. Leave a thumbs up if you did. Leave me a comment what video you want to see broken down. Next week's video, if you have not subscribed yet, you may want to. We talk personal finance on the channel. I talk entrepreneurship. I'm a business owner. I give a lot of my business tips out. And we also talk the stock market the most, how to be a successful investor. This series we do every single week. Thank you for watching, guys, and have a great day.